Uh, our next speaker uh, is Professor Park jong hye from Academy of Korean Studies. Please welcome Professor Park. Thank you very much for introduction, Professor Kim. Um, first of all, it's a great honor to have a chance to share my academic interest with you here at Hanmosu Colloquium. Um, previously, Professor Yi gave us a broad introductory uh, presentation about u i g u e books. So today, I'd, I'd like to speak on the u i g u e uh, produced during King y o n g j o and j o n g j o period in 18th century. Because of the strict and conservative Neo-Confucian rites, the tradition of making u i g u e did not see much change over time until the early 20th century. <laughs> Nevertheless, the production and quality of u i g u e varied depending on the king. Therefore, uh, changing the way in which u i g u e was compiled only occurred by the specific order of the king himself. So, I'd like to focus on some characteristics of u i g u e illustrations, often called as u i g u e d o produced under two of the most extraordinary kings, y o n g j o and j o n g j o During this time, many novel attempts were made in the making and content building of u i g u e Also, a systematic and well-organized table of contents was typically established. Let's look at the u i g u e produced during the era of King y o n g j o first. Living 83 years and reigning for 42 years, he was the most long-lived king of Joseon. During his reign, y o n g j o published over 130 kinds of u i g u e books. I'd like to talk about the new characteristics of illustrations in u i g u e during the King y o n g j o period by looking at the three particular kinds of u i g u e books. They are u i g u e for royal archery ceremony, u i g u e for making the spirit tablet of the propositors of royal e clan, and u i g u e for King y o n g j o s second wedding. Let's look into the u i g u e for royal archery ceremony first. King y o n g j o made a lot of effort to uh, modify the system of right, state rights and to restore the royal uh, guard of honor. He revived several, several state rights whose tradition had ceased for 200 years since the Japanese invasion in 1592. Such rights include the royal archery ceremony, the king's plowing ceremony, and the queen's sericulture ceremony. As an attempt to continue the ceremonial heritage founded by the previous kings, King y o n g j o ordered the u i g u e books to be compiled for each event. Therefore, we find an unprecedented variety of events depicted in u i g u e s The royal archery ceremony, which, book, which took place for the first time in over 200 years, was preceded by the king's paying of a memorial service at the Hall of Confucius in the National Confucian Academy. After the memorial service, King y o n g j o performed the archery with a group of high officials. In addition to making u i g u e y o n g j o stipulated the ritual protocols and the rank of position chart in the sequel to the five rights of the nation, which was uh, published in 1744. The illustrations of this archery u i g u e are special enough to catch one's eyes. Created in 1743, 
these Uigedo are new types with no previous example, and they are almost identical to the scenes of the cult documentary paintings. In this Uigedo, the ceremonies procedures are portrayed in three parts, which are actually demonstrations attended by the king and by pairs of high officials, and a scene in which the awards and penalties are given. When four separate pages are supposedly connected, we can see the whole picture. The Uyghur text on the rank position and arrangement of every participant and utensil accurately correspond to those in the Uyghur illustrations. It is clear that the illustration by itself was meant to convey the basic procedure or setup of the event. These uh, new types of illustrations demonstrate how King Yongjo understood the value and power of, it, power of visual reference more than any other leader of Joseon Dynasty. He must have known that the later generations would understand the ceremony procedures more easily when they were depicted in the style of documentary paintings. Important events such as this royal archery ceremony were also celebrated by the government officials who participated in the event by the long established custom of commissioning documentary paintings as private tokens of commemoration and camaraderie. The pictorial style of the Uyghurs and documentary paintings often turned out to be similar because it was mostly the same group of cult painters who worked on the both. The second notable Uyghur book uh, produced during King Yongjo period it is the Uyghur for making the split tablet for the propositors of royal Yi clan. This Uyghur is distinguishing example showing the king's endeavor to empower the status of the dynasty. In 1771, Yongjo built a new ancestral shrine called Jogyongmyo for Yi Han, who was the progenitor of the royal Yi family. The construction venue was notable north side of the Gyeonggijeon Hall in Jeolla province, where the portrait of King Tejo, the founder of Joseon Dynasty, was enshrined. This Uyghur contains two kinds of uh, illustrations. One is the Banchado depicting the procession toward the Jogyongmyo. The other is the scene portraying the crossing the Hangang River. This picture shows pairs of small boats uh, pulling a big boat with a split tablet in it to cross the Hangang River. Although the multiple perspectives are mixed here, the whole picture makes it easy to understand how the tablet was transported across the river. Before the time of Yongjo, Uyghur illustrations that portray the conducting of ceremony mostly included the pictures of linear processions. However, the two Uyghur pain paintings we just looked, looked at occasionally adopted an aerial perspective, a technique that had been used in the documentary paintings. Therefore, it is notable that a different perspective taken from documentary paintings was adopted in the Uyghur illustrations in 18th century. The third meaningful Uyghur book produced during King Yongjo era is the, King, uh, is the Uyghur for King Yongjo's wedding of 1759. 
During the reign of King Yongjo, uh, the procession of the king's grand palanquin was for the first time documented and included in the Uyghur books. The first example of the king's palanquin procession appears on the Uyghur, depicting the Suk King Sukjong's portrait transported to be enshrined in the portrait hall in 1748. King Yongjo's procession followed after the palanquin, containing the new portrait, highlighting the significance of the portrait hall. The king's procession with uh, his grand palanquin is also drawn in the Banchado in Uyghur of King Yongjo's wedding of 1759. A Banchado illustration that depicts a royal wedding typically showed the procession of the queen to be going out of her temporary residence and entering the palace before the couple's formal, formal wedding bow. In this Uyghur, however, the king himself goes to the uh, temporary residence to greet and uh, to, com uh, to accompany the bride toward the palace. The pro procedure of accompanying the bride to the palace was established in the early 16th century, but it was not put in statutory form till Yongjo era. This longer procession with an additional schedule meant that the Banchado in the, in the 1759 Uyghur was much thicker in volume than other wedding Uyghur books. This Banchado shows a set of changes in production method of Uyghur do as well. The illustrations in Uyghur made for King's view had been done entirely by, by hand, by hand before. But in 1759, the development of carving technique allowed the King's palanquin and its bearers to be carved as one wooden stamp. This one stem technique where the preliminary sketches, engraving, and printing created a harmony had never been used before the wedding Uyghur of 1759. Carving the palanquin and its bearers in one stem must have been a different task, difficult task, but it seems that the king's palanquin was regarded as a section important enough to take such an ambitious project. Except for the king's palanquin, the rest of the banchado here was depicted by hand. So this banchado is the first copy for king's perusal to incorporate hand drawing and woodblock printing. This doesn't mean that the painting was low in quality because the court painters added careful retouches over the rough outline, out, outlines and colors. Hence, the end result was a set of paintings that were as meticulous and splendid as the ones solely done by hand. It was King Jongjo, grandson of King Yongjo, who brought a set of revolutionary changes in the procedures by which Uyghur books were made. The particular characteristics of Uyghur created under King Jongjo can be singled out uh, through the two of the re remaining Uyghur books. Uyghur for the King Jongjo's visit to Hyolyungwan tomb in 1796, hereafter I refer it Jongni Uyghe, and Uyghe for the construction of Hwasong Citadel in 1801, hereafter I refer it Hwasong Uyghe. The Ulmyo year 1795 was the 60th birth year of King Jongjo's both parents, Prince Sado and Lady Haegyeong. Therefore, in 1795, King Jongjo planned to visit the tomb of his father, accompanying his mother, and to host a celebratory banquet at the new city of Hwasong. 
These two key events, the visit to the royal tomb and hosting the banquet, posed a particular challenge for Zhengzhou in ordering the compilation of Uigui. Before execution of cult banquet in Uigui was recorded in text only. King Yongjo defined the rank position diagram of the cult banquet in the sequel to the five rights of the nation. <coughs> when the actual banquet was being planned, he inspect, inspected and approved the same type of diagram prior to the rehearsal. But the diagram did not end up included in Uigui. So there was no past example of Uigui illustrations that depicted a cold banquet to consult. Moreover, the king's visit to the royal tomb was a subject matter had, had uh, never been recorded in the Uigui books. Therefore, a significant change was needed to put the two very different events, visiting the tomb and the birthday banquet, in one set of Uyghur books. Finally, Zhengzhou extended the number of volumes into eight with, more, with a more thorough and systematized table of contents so that the set of Uyghur books could exhibit all of the contents and information. In addition, this Uyghur was printed by metal movable types, which allowed the production of 101 copies. Considering that the previous Uyghur books were handwritten and reached mere five to eight copies, the number is incomparable. Unlike the previous Uyghe books, in which the illustrations were inserted in the middle of the text, this set of Jongni Uyghe boasts a separate volume that contains a schedule of events, a list of persons who were in charge, and 112 pages of woodblock print. The first illustration shows the venue of the event. Palace at Hwasong Citadel followed the birthday banquet for Lady Haegyeong at Bongsudang, uh, which was uh, considered the most important by the king. And there are six more ceremonies depicted. The illustrations of the Jongni Uigui are notable in that the dominant pictorial style is based on documentary paintings, which was, as I mentioned earlier, a newly adapted tradition by King Yongjo. The same style was used in the eightfold commemorative screen painting of the same subject. Also, there are the Banchado paintings of the royal procession going back and forth between Hanyang and Hwasong, and the scene of Ponton Bridge to continue the procession. A linear perspective, an increasingly popular technique in the late 18th century Joseon is applied to this Ponton Bridge painting so that the sense of depth and distance is rendered more vividly. As you can see, the Banchado is different from the previous painting. It shows the entire length and scale of the actual procession com comprised of about 1,600 attendants and more than 800 horses. This enormous parade was recorded throughout the 63 pages. This Uigedo records every proper position of the participant, but also boosts more, boosts more uh, natural 
renditions of the bodily movement and individual uh, faces. Furthermore, the illustrations for 14 different types of court dance, flowers for various occasions, musical instruments, costumes for a different group of people, and other ceremonial objects such as furniture and tableware are documented. While maintaining the conventional format, these illustrations provide more detailed and systematic portrayal of court events of appliance used in these events. Depicting objects from various perspectives are also meant to enhance the uh, understanding of the reader. For example, on 11 pages long graphic diagrams shows, show, uh, show the palanquin written by Lady Hagyong from all four sides. Moreover, supplementary components of each side are also depicted in extra detail so that any repair or reproduction can be done based on these paintings. The whole drawing of an object is comp complemented by those detailing small sections to make it easier to explain the object. This idea can be seen as an influence from the Wu Beiju Treatise on Armament Technology which is one of the most comprehensive Chinese military books published in 1621. Of the 738 illustrations of Wu Beizhu, some contain com complementary explanation depicting both the whole and partial uh, perspectives. Another significant Uyghur uh, de designed under the special order of King Zhongzhou was Hwasong Uyghur. It is done uh, in almost the same format of the earlier Zhongni Uyghur I've just discussed. When Zhongzhou visited his father's tomb in Hwasong in 1795, the city's fortress was under construction. The project of construction was finished in 1796, but the uh, compilation of Uyghur was completed in 1801, a year after Zhangzhou's death. Just like the illustrations of Zhangli Uyghur, this one starts with an overall view of Hwasong. Hwasong. Uh, the picture seems to serve almost a, a pictorial map of city and as a visual counterpart of the equally detailed text. And just like the picture of Lady Hegyang's palanquin, the book includes a set of sketches detailing a crane. As for the architect architectural uh, structure of the fortress, we see three different perspectives for the citadel walls and tower. Two from inside and outside the wall, walls and a see-through sketch. In depicting the cult, uh, called Yuhyeonggo, which transported various materials, shading was used to enhance the sense of three-dimensionality. There are also pictures depicting the banquet to celebrate the uh, completion of construction and the bestowing of meal to workers by the king. One of the most interesting uh, features of the Hwasong Uyghe is that the depiction of public buildings goes beyond a mere record and um, almost beautiful. Uh, becomes a beautiful landscape painting. Unlike the previous architectural illustrations in Uyghe, which often portrayed only overall layouts or facades of buildings, 
These pictures allowed a glimpse of the general landscape as well as of the function of the building. In fact, the level of accuracy and detail of these drawing, drawings is so high that they were used to restore the ruined citadel after the Korean War. King Jongju was a, a highly enlightened figure. The drastic changes in the uh, compilation of Uigwe under King Jongju suggest that there must have been a strong underlying motivation. In order to revolutionize the previous system that had been maintained for, for generations, the king did a lot of research. He collected and studied a very wide, wide range of Chinese books and applied their best features to make King Uge of new format. Apart from Wu Beiji, which I mentioned earlier, other books that influenced the production of Hwasang Uigwe were Chi Chi Tu Shuo, the illustrated explanation of Western mechanical knowledge and devices, which was first translated into Chinese in 1627, and Gu Jin Tu Shu Ji Cheng, the complete collection of ancient and modern books published in 1726, and some Chinese local records, Fang Zhi. It is very uh, likely that Zhang Zhou drew his insp inspiration from the documentary paintings made by his contemporary contemporaries in Qing China, such as an illustrated book uh, that commemorated commem commemorates the 80th birthday of Emperor Qianlong. For example. There are some similarities between the two Uyghurs and Wan Su Sheng Tian. Both, both used metal movable types for text and larger wood block prints for images. There are no demonstrated evidence that King Zhengzhou actually had a chance to uh, look at into these books, but it is likely that he had at least heard and known about them. These distinct qualities of two Uyghur books are different from the ones produced in other eras. One reason that such high quality Uyghur could be produced was the system of the painters in waiting at Jujangak. This system allowed many skilled painters to be recruited to the court and to be trained, which ultimately elevated the level of court paintings. The selected painters were on call or readily available whenever there was an important art-related project. It is highly likely that both Zhang Ni Uigue and Hwa Sang Uigue were executed by the painters in waiting of Gyujanggak. Again, it was Zhang Zhou's intent to reinforce authority of the court and of his own by producing these Uigue books in different formats. But the next Uigue made for the investiture and wedding of the crown prince in 18. 100 was compiled in a rather traditional method. The biggest significance of the Zhangli Uyghur lies in its influence on the production of 19th century Uyghur for court banquets. The new procedures for Zhangli Uyghur were maintained in the early 19th century during the reign King Sunjo, who was the son of Zhangzhou until King Gojong in the, in the 20th century. While uh, the most of Uyghe books were uh, compiled following the traditional system, those made for court banquets were always modeled after the Zhangli Uyghe. 
As I explained before, Jeongni Uyge commemorated the 60th birthday year of Lady Hegyeong under Jeongjo. Uh, in 1801, in 1809, 1809, King Sunjo adopted the format of Jeongni Uyge for the 60th coming of age anniversary of Lady Hegyeong. Therefore, Jeongni Uyge continued continued to be used as the prototype specifically for Uyghur of cult banquets. So far, I have talked about some novel characteristics of Uyghur illustrations during the King Yongjo and Jeongjo period. The two kings efficiently used the power of images in Uyghur not only to heighten their authority but also to for facilitate a smoother p preparation of subsequent cult rites. More specifically, King Yongjo attempted to reinforce his administrative achievement to the future generations by inserting changes or creation of rites in the Uge books. King Yongjo recognized the potential impact of Uge illustrations and thus Many made the books easier to understand for the readers. At the same time, he strived to maintain the fundamental goal of Uyghur. Accurate documentation and permanent conservation of the culturized protocols. Ultimately, the two kings succeeded in using the Uyghur to reinforce the authority of royal family and to leave their legacy to the subsequent generations. Thank you. Um, uh, in this first session, I think we really had a um, uh, great introduction to the Uyghur documents. Professor E was able to provide us with a general intro introduction of Uyghur and also five rights, how five rights were recorded uh, in the Uyghur documents, um, which were the major doc uh, uh, rituals throughout the Joseon dynasty. And then Professor uh, Par Park was able to give us more specific, uh, detailed analysis of 18th century U Uyghur during Yongjo and uh, Jeongjo period. And later on, during the video screening, we'll be able to see actually those, um, the military rights and the royal procession, they're all included in that uh, video clip that will give you a better understanding of what it actually uh, looked like. Mm -hmm.